Good morning or good evening as you're accessing this video. Uh, I'm Rich Hutchins. I'm coming to you from First Baptist Church. Uh, this is our Wednesday night study, something that we normally would do together, gathered as a, a church at 6 o'clock on Wednesday nights. But uh, beginning and hopefully ending in a way that's more communal, but beginning today a study of the book of Job uh, in this online format. Uh, hopefully we'll be able as we work through this study to, uh, to move from this video format to uh, in person, but we'll also continue to do uh, an online recording so that those of you who are not able to get out will be able to have access to this study if you'd like to do so. We're going to be looking at the book of Job for the next 13 weeks approximately. Uh, there's an outline that I can share with you of how we're going to be looking at it, the readings for each one of the, uh, the, the studies that we'll be doing. Job, of course, is uh, one of the books of wisdom literature. It's an extremely long book. It has 42 chapters. Um, and uh, today is just simply an introduction to uh, the book of Job, uh, a way of getting in, kind of getting our, our, our toes into the waters, so to speak. Uh, Job has always been a book that has fascinated um, believers. Uh, it's a book that's always fascinated uh, me because of the unique nature of the book. Uh, it is, as I mentioned, one of the books of wisdom literature. It, uh, it also composes a, uh, a kind of a combination of prose and wisdom. Uh, it's a book that has had a great deal of influence on our, our culture. Um, if I were to mention to you certain expressions that we use commonly, uh, you might be surprised to find that they actually come from the book of Job. Uh, expressions like being weighed in the balance, uh, that comes from Job 31.6, where Job says, Let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know my integrity. Uh, another expression that we use quite a bit is uh, to get to the root of a matter. Uh, this actually comes from Job 19.28, where Job says, uh, uh, But you would say, why persecute we him, seeing the root of the matter is found in me? And so that expression has found its way into our, our vernacular. Uh, a couple of other expressions that we are commonly, um, that we're, we hear commonly, are to say that someone is nothing but skin and bones. That comes also from Job 19, where Job says, All my intimate friends detest me. Those I love have turned against me. I am nothing but skin and bones. Job 19 also has that expression, By the skin of your teeth. Uh, I have escaped by the skin of my teeth, Job says in Job 19, 19 and 21. Uh, giving up the ghost is one of the King James uh, translations of Job 3 verse, uh, I'm sorry, of Job, um, yes, Job 3 verse 11. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? And of course, there are many expressions like that that come from uh, the book of Job. And if you go to James chapter 5 verse 11, you have perhaps one of the more common expressions that people who've uh, never really read the book of Job, still know about the patience of Job, because James makes that reference uh, in his epistle. So we're going to look at the book of Job, and just this, uh, this morning, I want, to, uh, I want us to look at five uh, different questions just by way of introduction. I want to read the beginning of the book of Job, the prologue, and we'll come back to this next week as we begin looking at Job and then looking at Satan, and then, of course, looking at God, looking at the dialogues, and I'll walk with you through that in just a moment. Um, it says in verse 1 of chapter 1, In the land of Uz there was a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Now, just beginning at that point and taking the book of Job and its context, there are several things that we want to answer uh, about the book of Job this morning. And we're just going to use the who, what, when, where, why, and then perhaps even how. Who wrote the book of Job and, and who is Job? Uh, well, you know, 
Job tells us, the book tells us in the beginning that Job was a man who was blameless, upright, feared God, and shunned evil. The question has been always, well, but how does Job figure into the history of Israel? Who exactly was Job? Was he really a, an actual person? Or was he someone that the author simply invented in order to tell, uh, to get a certain message across about uh, God and how he relates to human suffering? Um, the perspective that, that we're going to take is that, that Job is an actual person who lived and lived his life out, lived through the tragic circumstances that we'll read about, but maintained his faith in God until the very end. Uh, we believe that not only because James 5, uh, 11, that passage references Job and talks about his patience, but also Ezekiel 14, 14 and 20 uh, talks about Job in the same breath that it talks about Daniel and Noah. So unless we're willing to concede that Daniel and Noah were both fictional characters or individuals that were contrived, then I think that we're actually forced to, uh, to recognize that the Bible looks at Job as an actual historical personage, that he is someone who lived and had a history and that the events that happened were not things that were con contrived, they were, not, they were not made up, but were simply reporting uh, what had had happened. But the question, of course, then becomes, well, if that's who Job is, well, then who is it that wrote the book of Job? Uh, any passing familiarity with the book of Job would, uh, would, would say to you that, well, probably, although some have suggested Job as the writer, uh, probably Job himself was not the writer because the writer uh, would know all of the behind-the-scenes story about the uh, council in heaven, about Satan's interview with God, and about the proposition that was made. But Job himself, the character in the book, is, is ignorant of what has happened. He has no idea that, uh, that this dialogue has taken place. So a lot of people say, well, Job probably then himself was not the author. Some have suggested that uh, Elihu, who is one of the Friends of Job that is introduced towards the end of the book was perhaps the, the author. Uh, the, uh, the rabbis have always contended for Moses as the author. Uh, one of the reasons that um, Moses has been suggested as the author is because some of the language similarities, the word El Shaddai for God, the, the, um, the, the, the holy word for God, Yahweh, is used in the book of Job. Uh, so they're wanting to, the Jews, uh, the rabbis would want to ascribe it to someone who's a part of Jewish history. Um, and really, in, in some sense, who the author is, whether it was Moses or someone else, it is undeniable that there is a great deal of, of connection in language. But equally undeniable is that there are a lot of expressions, a lot of phraseology in the book of Job that are totally foreign to the Hebrew and are more at home in the Aramaic, a different language, which also points to perhaps a different time and at least in terms of the oral telling of the story, uh, a different author. That is to say, the same person who wrote the story down, or the person who wrote the story down, may not be the same person who originally uh, received the story, was the one who who knew Job and was a witness of these events, that these events could have happened and been passed down orally and most likely were until someone who was familiar with the Jewish tradition, with the Jewish religion, uh, wrote down the story. Um, now, what that, is, what that tells us is that, that Job himself, uh, this man who was from the land of Uz, U-Z, uh, and as you read about his life, this man was probably not a Jew in the sense that we would recognize um, Abraham as one of the patriarchs, and of course then uh, Moses and David and all of those who are, are key figures through the, uh, through the Old Testament. Uh, it, is, it is likely that Job lived in a time uh, around the time of Abraham's father, uh, there are some indications, clues about that in terms of uh, language in the book, in terms of customs, customs and traditions. And so we'll talk a little bit about that um, 
later on, but I just simply mentioned to uh, you now that certain things in the book, such as uh, Job offering um, sacrifices, uh, such as the equal inheritance for both his daughters and his sons, those are things were outside of Jewish tradition, which would suggest that Job predated um, the giving of the law and the formation of the, the people of Israel, but was a part of the Semitic uh, tribes the, in, in the Arab uh, peninsula area, the Arab uh, lands, that he was a part of that larger tradition. So that touches on the who. Now what about what? Uh, what is the book of Job? Um, is it, it's, uh, it is actually a book that's comprised, as I mentioned a moment ago, of part prose, uh, the first and second chapter, and then the, uh, the last chapter, verse uh, chapter 42. Uh, so it's the telling of a story that has the introduction of the, pre, the characters of Job and God and Satan, the council in heaven, uh, the three friends of Job who come when they find of all the tragedy that has befallen him. And then it shifts in chapter 3 to Hebrew poetry. And that's why Job is situated where it is. You have Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, the wisdom literature, uh, which is all of it uh, poetic in nature. Now, when we talk about Hebrew poetry, uh, it's not poetry in the same sense that we think of poetry in our Western uh, perspective. It's not so much something that rhymes or has meter, but it is rather that idea of parallelism where a, an author, and of course if you've read Proverbs you see this for a great deal, an author will state one idea and will state the same idea with different words immediately following that. Um, for instance, uh, to say of God, His ways are not, my ways are not your ways, nor are my thoughts your thoughts. It is that idea of restating the same thing in parallel. And we find that all throughout Job, uh, beginning in chapter 3, all the way to the, uh, the end where it goes back into a, a prose section. So there was a, there was a poetic um, device that was used in order to tell the story of Job's uh, dialogues with these friends that gathered around him. So... Um, when was it written? We've touched on that. Probably um, the story comes from the time uh, before Abraham. It is a very, very old story, um, with the exception of the story of the creation and the garden in Genesis, which is obviously the oldest story in the Bible. This is regarded to, as being one of the, the, uh, the, the, the next oldest stories. And, um, and, of course, that, that's not to say that uh, it wasn't written at a later time, but still, it is a very, very old story. They found uh, translations, what they call a Targum, of the book of Job that uh, have been translated into another language. Targum just means translation, uh, that uh, are, are quite old, uh, which would indicate that the story has been around for a, a long time. So uh, Job has a, a long history, probably dating from the time of the, uh, the patriarchs, if not before. Now, where did all this happen? Um, the, uh, we, we know that this happened in the, the Arab lands. We know this happened in that part of the Middle East. Uh, no one is, no archaeological evidence has really been able to identify uh, this place called uh, the land of Uz, Uz. Um, one of the clues that we do have in the book as to location comes in chapter 2, verse 11, when it begins to talk about Job's three, three friends, and it says that when Job's three friends, Eliphaz the uh, Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Mehamathite heard about the tragedies that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and to sympathize with him and to comfort him. And so the, these three men who obviously knew each other, who uh, lived close enough to Job, but it required a traveling a journey to get there to him. Uh, of all of those places that are named, we do know something about the land of uh, Eliphaz, or actually the city, uh, Temanite, which was a part of the kingdom of Edom. And so that gives us a little bit of a geographic 
uh, reference, kind of a southwest, to know that it was in that part of the Levant, uh, that area that this, uh, that this more than likely uh, took place. Now, why was the book of Job written? Uh, you know, there's, a, there's been a number of suggestions as to um, what the, the big idea, the big message of the book of Job uh, is. Um, one of the things I find very fascinating about Job is that um, there is no I told you why, nor is there any I told you so. You see, if you and I were to tell this story, and this would presuppose a little bit of a awareness of the story on your part, but of course there is this dialogue between God and Satan, in which Satan says basically Job only serves you for his own means, for his own ends, that that's the only reason, because you take care of him, he serves you. And after you have that dialogue between God and Satan, or the Satan, uh, Satan never appears again. That is to say, there is never a moment where, you know, if we, uh, good Western storytelling, we would have brought Satan back in at the, at the end and God would say to him, you see, I told you so. I told you that Job didn't serve me just because what he could get out of it. Uh, Job wasn't serving me just to be able to preserve his life. Uh, Job served me because uh, there is a, a depth of piety, of faithfulness. Uh, there is a, this strong strand of perseverance in his life. Um, but you never have that. You never have God going back to Satan and saying, I told you so. The other thing that's interesting is you never have God saying to Job, I, I, I'll tell you why. You see, Job raises all kinds of questions, not knowing anything that had happened in the council in heaven about why all this was happening. But God never really answers Job's questions. Uh, we never do get a, a, quote, satisfactory answer about why Job was suffering all the things uh, that he, he suffered. Uh, because of that, when you have people looking at the book of Job today, we ask a lot of questions about the book of Job that uh, we were asking from a very Western uh, perspective. Uh, why, why did Job suffer? Obvious question. Why did the innocent suffer? Uh, how is God involved in human suffering? Uh, does God's involvement in human suffering make God responsible in some way for human suffering? Uh, what is our role uh, in the suffering of people around us? Questions about God's sovereignty, about God's power. So there's many, many questions that, that we'll actually look at as we go through these studies, but realizing that these aren't necessarily the questions that Job uh, was written precisely uh, to answer. That doesn't mean that we can't uh, gain some wisdom, gain some insight. But uh, as we've looked at the, the message, the big idea of the book of Job, there's been several things that have been suggested. Uh, for instance, let me give you a few here. It's been suggested that the message of the book is that the righteous people uh, will suffer unjustly. Um, in other words, just to state the obvious, here's a man who is presented as a righteous man, is suffering therefore, is not just, he's not suffering for what he did in any specific instance uh, of any particular sin. And so the message that just realize righteous people will suffer unjustly. Um, another message, that the orthodox or traditional answers are not always true or appropriate. And of course, when his three friends gather around him, this is what you get. You get these very traditional uh, answers that come from uh, and you find them in Proverbs, you find them even in Psalms uh, about the righteous and suffering. And so what uh, some say is, well, the book of Job is written to, to basically counter this, to say, you know, these, these answers are not always appropriate, they're not always sufficient, they're not always true. A third reason that has been given in the message of the book is that God will tolerate honest questions. And certainly we do see that. Um, God allows Job to ask question after question. They're very hard, very uh, pointed questions. They, they have a lot of pathos, a lot of emotion in them. And God allows those questions to, to come uh, to him. Although once again, God doesn't necessarily answer those questions point for point. The fourth uh, message that has been suggested 
is that <clears throat> sin is not always the cause of evil and suffering uh, in the world. And that is to say that a particular sin does not always align with a particular uh, circumstance. Uh, and we'll talk much more about that as we get into the book. Uh, the fifth, and certainly this was something that we could all uh, affirm, that God should not be served simply because, or that God should be served simply because He is God. God should be served simply because He is God. In other words, uh, we don't serve God basically to serve ourselves. Uh, we don't do what we know we should do simply for what we're going to, to get out of that relationship. So God should be served simply because He is God. And then uh, sixth, one of the suggested lessons from Job is, um, and I think we would all have to agree with this, that, that God and the world, all that's going on around us, and certainly as we're walking through these days with COVID, these things cannot always be put into easily definable uh, categories. We can't always find what seems to be these uh, simple, um, these simple solutions. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the authors I read said this, and I thought this was really very, very insightful. Um, uh, the the dialogues that we'll be looking at, the three cycles. Uh, they seem to go on and on, repeating the same arguments over and over again, but never coming to a definitive answer. And he said, in fact, that is exactly the way the problem of suffering, suffering is experienced. That we do go through these cycles of, of just asking questions, but not really coming to a definitive answer. That author goes on to say uh, this, characteristic of most false comforters, is that they give simplistic answers to life's most painful questions. And I would, I would say amen to that, that when you find simplistic answers to very, very deep and complicated uh, questions, then you usually are looking at someone who ha is giving you false comfort. Uh, the answers to life's questions are much, much more uh, complicated. Um, the... Uh, the book of Job itself uh, is a book that, as one author said, unlike the Proverbs and unlike the Psalms, it's very difficult just to jump into Job somewhere and pull out something and say, okay, I, I understand this uh, completely apart from its context. Uh, you can do that with Psalms and Proverbs. You can take a Psalm and that Psalm can minister to you. But it's difficult to do that with just one chapter of the, the book of, of Job, with the exception perhaps of chapter 28, which is a, a poem to wisdom. For the most part, to understand Job, you have to take Job as the whole. You have to understand the whole of the, of the story. Uh, the cycles of speeches that take place between Job and, uh, and Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar and then Elihu at the end are, are in some ways cyclical uh, that is to say that they, they come in a very structured way. Uh, they'll have three speeches, three responses, three speeches, three responses. And then Bildad and Eliphaz come in in the end and Job responds. So there's this cycle that takes place. And if you, if you follow it, there is a very... Um, it's not that a, an argument is being developed so much as Job is fleshing out uh, a, a very basic contention that he has been accused unjustly, that he is suffering unjustly, and that he wants to be able to speak to God, to be able to plead his case to God. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the interesting, um, I think, um, summaries of the book has been put into the vernacular and uh, again, I'll put this up so that you can get uh, access, have access to it. Uh, but it's, a, it's an interesting uh, walk through the, uh, the book of Job. Uh, and it develops the argument like this. I'm not going to read the actual verses, but I'll read the references and give you the summary of what each of these are saying and how Job responds, because this is a, this is a dialogue. Uh, beginning in verse 4, verses 7 and 8, Eliphaz says basically this, You are suffering because you have sinned. 
Now that is a that is a foundational accusation, a foundational belief, supposition of his three friends and Elihu as well, who really brings nothing new to the discussion. He simply goes over a ground territory they've already covered. Eliphaz says this theme: "You're suffering because you've sinned." Job replies in verse six, uh, chapter six, verse ten: "If I have sinned, prove it to me." And that's essentially what Job is saying in six ten and verse twenty four. Then Bildad comes back in chapter 8, verse 6, and verse 20, and he says, Well, since God didn't protect you or your children, it's obvious that you have sinned. Now they're pointing to particular instances. Look at what's happened. You can't deny the loss of your children, uh, the, the loss of everything in your life. Job responds in 10, chapter 10, verse 2, God knows I am not guilty of anything. Just a flat-out denial. Zophar then comes back in chapter 11, verse 4, and he says this to Job. You're actually getting off easy. Confess and repent, and God will restore you. And so Zophar says, you know, you, you might as well not deny it. You just need to confess it, and God's going to give you everything back. Job responds to him in chapter 12, verse 2, and he says this. I know better than you what's going on. You all by contrast, are just making up lies about my sins. Eliphaz responds in chapter 15, verse 14, and he says this, Everyone sins, so no one is righteous, not even you who are, who are suffering because of it. And so, so far, Eliphaz says to him, Listen, it's, it's, it's obvious that everybody sins and that no one is righteous, not even you who are suffering because of your sin. Job responds, and he says in chapter 16, verse 16, uh, I am suffering, <laughs> it's undeniable, but with a pure, with pure hands and a clear conscience. Bildad comes back in chapter 18, verse 5, and he says, uh, well, there's worse to come because of your wickedness. You know, so it's beginning to get very strident at this point. Job re responds to him, chapter 19, verse 3, he says, your accusations wound me, and I am denied justice. Zophar comes back in 20, verse 1 through 5, and he says, All history proves your wickedness. What happened to you is what always happens to the wicked. So now he's spreading a very broad, the, the net very widely, and he's saying, look, look, you cannot deny that this is what happens to all the wicked. Job responds in verse 21, verse, uh, chapter 21, verse 34, On the contrary, Job says, you're wrong. The wicked seem to prosper which means that your answers are worthless. Eliphaz comes back in chapter 22, verse 5, and he says, Your evil life is evident to all. Just admit it, and God will give you peace. And then Job comes back in chapter 23, and he says this, If I were able to talk to God, I could prove that I had been righteous, and He would acquit me. Interesting, Bildad comes back in chapter 25, verse 4, and says, Are you sure about that? And he just lets that hang out there. How can a man be right, more right, be right before God? And then Job in chapter 26 uh, says uh, this. He says, Yes, I am innocent. And so, uh, and so this gives you kind of that sense of how these arguments take place and how... Again, it's not the development of a, a sophisticated argument, but rather it is very much a development of um, the various facets of the same argument about why righteous uh, suffer. Now, there's four things that I think that we, can, that we can look at in terms of that basic question of why the righteous suffer. Uh, and we'll look at these more in detail. Um, but... Uh, you know, one of them is that uh, people suffer because God is good, but He's not powerful. This was an argument that has been made for, uh, by others for a long time. Uh, God's a good God, but He's just not powerful enough to, uh, to uh, control everything. Another argument has been that God is powerful, but He's not good. And of course, there you would have the specter of a God who's very malicious, who uh, takes delight in the suffering of others not the God that we know. The third argument is, and this is interesting because this is very much a lot uh, where our, our uh, 
early fathers were, many of whom were theists, is that God is good and powerful. He is good and He is powerful, but He's just not interested. Uh, God takes about as much interest in what's happening here as we do in what goes on in an ant pile on the ground. And so God may be a very powerful God, a very good God. He's created everything, but God basically has taken His hands off. He's just not interested in what's going on. And of course, we know from uh, what we have seen in the Lord Jesus Christ, that the fourth answer is the answer uh, that we are uh, confident is true, that God is good and powerful and is interested because He has sent His Son, Jesus Christ. And that is where uh, we find hope and where eventually uh, Job comes to as uh, he comes to the end of the book. And of course, that great pasture, I know, a pas- passage, I know that my Redeemer lives. And so that's the the confident, uh, kind of the, the horizon point that the entire book of Job is, uh, is carrying us to. So it's going to be an exciting journey as we, uh, as we make this journey together. Uh, we're going to begin then this next study looking in more detail, chapter 1, verses 1 through, um, through 5, as we look at the, the person of Job and uh, who Job was, what, what God tells us through his word about Job and the whole question of righteousness and the righteous uh, suffering. So I look forward to talking to you again next week. Uh, If you have any questions, uh, please just let me know. I'd love to hear from you, and God bless.